so you mentioned you um, did the first book and you just put it out there. Um, what was the feedback like on, on the book, on the experience, and how did that impact the second book? Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, good question. Sp- yeah, speaking about like the, the customers that were getting involved or just general, you know, friends well, and family, that sort of thing. What was quite funny is that with so i'm a big apple fan i know you can't see this but i've got a lot of apple products in this room and so i knew right from the start and every founder will say this that they want a great user experience and what i wanted was both the good book and the nice uh, paper stock and that kind of thing but i also wanted a nice box that it comes in and like you know nice when you peel it off and the experience and the whole thing and one of the things that i kind of i don't regret doing it but the original book and it was kind of white mostly came this really nice white box it was custom made and it had like a tear strip on it and you fold it up and it was colorful and it said the roadmap to work and it was great but the issue was as soon as you'd opened it it was just waste it would just sit there and then either they keep it just to keep the book in but it was really tatty or it go in the bin or the recycling and just from a sustainability point of view i hated it because i thought well actually i my first batch was 500 bucks I had 500 sets of this that I knew was just waste. So I knew for version two, sustainability was really at the core of everything I wanted to do. Removed all use of plastics, uh, improved the actual kind of content of stuff. So when people say to me, uh, a prime example was actually, there's three modules on sales. And there's a lady who's a founder who sells both B2B and B2C. Mm -hmm. And when we were going through the different concepts, she'd actually say to me, which ones which which ones do i use for b2c and which ones are b2b i hadn't even thought to explain that because in my own head sorry it made sense and it's that kind of thing that you do need genuine user feedback to kind of see what works and one of the big things that i've been doing more recently is actually looking at my competition um really looking at really really big entities like top of their game almost netflix level stuff what do they do? How does it work? What do I like? What do I not like? And go back to the Gymshark example, massive fan of the company. And I bought some of their stuff recently because I even want to see what packaging does it come in? How quickly does it come? What does it work? Because that's the level I'm aiming for. The almost, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is that when they launch, they aim too small. So in the Northeast of England, where we're both based, if you start your business and you kind of only aim to the local market and you interact with local people about local funding or whatever it's going to be very difficult to break into ghana as well if you actually design it from scratch for the international market uh, and that includes you know your branding your imagery everything about that kind of thing it will gain so much more traction in so i think i've got about five users in, users in ghana but then hopefully it'll be six and then it'll be 12 and then it'll be 24 is where if I didn't have a diverse, uh, you know, set of cultures within my branding and materials, it'd be zero. And you can imagine that for most um, Northeast businesses that have been around for 30 years, probably sell nothing into Ghana. And it's that balance of just, you know, rarely look at global cultures, what fits, what doesn't, then build a product, which is actually they're interested in. Prime example in India, uh, I think probably to do with history, they still love the UK and they really respect what we do. But the growth and demand for uh, business education in India is huge. And they've got a population above a billion people. One of my ta- uh, tactics, you know, moving forward is to actually, yes, I'm going to try and break America, but actually that market, because they speak English. Yes, they speak other languages, but it's really, even though I, technically with the roadmap, I only launched it 11 months ago, but I'm already aiming at that level because that's where I want to be, if that makes sense. And it, but it's all the, the kind of feedback and what works and what doesn't work. And then using social platforms where people can access it anywhere in the world is a way to amplify your kind of message. Brilliant. And yeah, India is massive. I think they're the third biggest in the world for the, for the startup scene as well, mm-hmm. just rapidly growing to a, an immense rate. Um, so was there any um, challenges getting the book or the courses into these countries? Was there any sort of barriers <laughs> that occurred or was it plain sailing? No, no. You know, and this is part of the learning curve. And again, I'm going to quote Jim Shark again. I was looking at how they've done their distribution. Was So I, in the UK, I've got two packs right there they're going to send out. If I send one to you and one to Liverpool and one to London, it'll get there tomorrow. I can send one to Paris, Berlin, most places in Europe, and it'll be there three days, maybe. The first time I tried to send a pack to Nigeria, no joke, it took three or four months. 
when I send stuff to America right now, and this is paid top rate tracked signed Royal Mail kind of thing. So, you know, within reason, not the UPS, but within reason, best I can do, you're still talking in like three, four weeks. And it's the logistical challenges that I now I'm starting to tackle that I know that if I really want to break America to the level I want, because if you think about a customer, when I order stuff on Amazon, I'm happy if it arrives in two days. But if it arrives quicker, I feel special. I'm like, oh, it's not impressive. Oh, they must really have their shit together. Their logistics and operations are really good. So I, I want people, even though I could ship it in 48 hours, I always do 24 because I want that little delight of people to go, oh, that came quick because it again reflects on the whole brand. But I know for what I'm trying to do, if I genuinely want to break America, which is the highest value market, I need in-country distribution. I can't be sending stuff from the UK to America because it'll cost too much, it'll take too long, and it doesn't give the great customer experience. So one of my tasks for this year is to travel to America, meet with distributors, meet with printers, and actually have in-country delivery so that someone, uh, Shimshark, have their distribution in California and Ohio, interestingly, so East and West Coast. But it's that kind of level of, if you want to build a great user experience in North America, that includes how quickly they get it. And it's all of these details, but you never know that until you start to ship stuff. And that, like there's loads of stuff that you learn to do with export codes and commodity codes and packaging. and But it all happens over time. But actually, I kind of love it. And it's that balance of because I, I genuinely appreciate the craft of anyone that does what you do or the Perchet team do or what I do. Because it is difficult, I like the learning curve because ironically, the harder something is to do, the harder it is to copy. And therefore, what you're then doing is cementing your own place in the market because you're able to do difficult things. And because of that, you'll be successful, if that makes sense. So it's almost for any founder who's willing to take the difficult route to kind of, you know, follow. If you can survive, you'll be so much stronger for it because actually your competitors won't be brave enough to actually follow, if that makes sense.